so it's wonderfully open to hosting. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for coming. I think we're gonna I think we're gonna get started. <laughs> Um, so thank you all very much for coming to today's launch of the 2007 uh, Demographic and Health Survey uh, DHS for, for Liberia. Uh, we're thrilled to be, to be hosting this, uh, this session. Uh, my name is Gib Clark. I'm the coordinator of the Wilson Center's Global Health Initiative. Um, before we get started, I want to just take a minute of your time just to tell you about the Wilson Center. Uh, I know I see so many familiar faces, so forgive the repetition. Um, the Wilson Center was started in 1968 by an act of Congress um, as the living memorial to uh, Woodrow Wilson, who was the, our, our 29th president. Um, as he was our first president with a P, our only president with a PhD, uh, for better or for worse, uh, Congress set up the, the center as a living memorial to bring together the worlds of ideas and policy. So that's what we try to do here. Um, the Global Health Initiative is a newer uh, project here at the center. Uh, it was formed uh, because uh, our 20 or so programs here at the center, both our regional programs, such as our Africa program, our Asia program, and our topical programs, pretty much everyone was talking about health. So we wanted to bring it all together um, under one umbrella. And in addition to this, um, to this function, we also do our own programming on, on topics such as maternal health, health in post-conflict and post-disaster settings, and uh, studying health's impact on development. Uh, we're, we're excited to be hosting, uh, co-hosting this with our Africa program. Um, unfortunately, uh, the Africa program director, uh, Howard Wolpe, is, is uh, back in Michigan today and unable to be here. But we have uh, a lot of their staff and uh, thank them for their, for their help in putting this event together. Um, this is not our first time doing a DHS. We did, a, we did a, an event of the, of the uh, 2006 India DHS, uh, which, was, which was a nice event. And... Um, uh, we, we like doing these because they're, they're among the most trusted sources of up-to-date info on, on population, health, social conditions. Um, the Liberia one, as you'll hear, is significant in that it, it reveals some promising trends on HIV, on fertility, and on uh, child mortality. And it also highlights the challenges to come, including malaria, immunizations, and, and contraceptive use. Um, we've, got a, we've got a good team of, of experts here that are going to be talking with you. We have, uh, first we'll have Tornola Vapila, who is the Deputy Minister of Health for Planning, Research, and Development um, in Liberia. He's served his country for many years and has worked with such groups as the Transitional Justice Working Group and the West African Network for Peace. He's also notably a veteran of the Wilson Center. This is, I think, his third time speaking here, and he appeared on our dialogue, um, radio, and television program as well a couple of years ago. Um, next we'll hear from Ann Cross, the Deputy Director of Survey Operations at Macro International. She's a demographer with 35 years of experience in population-based uh, surveys in developing countries. Uh, she worked in the Kenyan National Bureau of Statistics and at the University of North Carolina before coming to Macro, where she's been for, um, I guess, almost 20 years. And then we'll hear from Hannah Gaidane, who is a communications associate at Macro, and she is responsible for disseminating data and making it accessible to all sorts of audiences, uh, such as this one. And uh, she uh, was a Peace Corps volunteer in Guinea and Sierra Leone, and has a Master's of Public Health from the Bloomberg School at Hopkins. Uh, I'd also like to recognize Jacob Adetunji and Krista Stewart, the, uh, the, the CTOs for USAID's uh, DHS program. Um, They'll be on hand should there be any other questions about, about uh, this or other DHS uh, surveys. Uh, one last uh, note before, I get, before we get started. This event is being webcast. You see the, the camera behind you. Um, so when we get to the question and answer, please wait for a microphone to come around so folks online um, can know who you are and uh, let us know your name and affiliation. So thanks again once for coming, and uh, we'll start with uh, Tornema. Hello. This okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am uh, very happy this morning to be amongst you all to talk about the great work that um, Macro has done in Liberia. The Liberia Demographic Health Survey was done at a time that uh, when we were in dire need of statistics for health. 
I can recall in 2006 uh, when Liberia was developing its interim poverty reduction strategy, we really didn't have the statistics to work with. It was a difficult situation for us because we had to rely on data that I think in most cases were very unreliable and inconsistent. Uh, why do I say the data was um, inconsistent and unreliable? In many instances, we found out that the data that we were working with would contradict each other. Some uh, people who gave uh, a contradictory figure on malaria, for instance, or for the uh, mortality rate when it comes to infant and uh, honor five. And we had to just decide which to take. Secondly, another experience that I can record was when we were writing the Global Fund uh, proposal for, for Liberia, for HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. It was a big challenge because at that time, the statistics, again, depend on who you spoke to at the time. If you spoke to an organization that was more uh, that, that had more power and influence, for instance, if you spoke to the UN agencies, you got one figure when it came to HIV/AIDS. When you spoke to conservative organizations, NGOs, you had a different figure. And then when you look at the government, there was a time that the government, um, the, the the previous government, in fact, got to the point where they had to take a decision and just quoted a figure of, 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 of 8% when it came to HIV AIDS. So we had this, this, this dilemma to work with when we were writing the proposal. Could we take a government figure? Could we rely on a, on, a, on a figure quoted by UN agencies? Or could we rely on the figure, figures quoted by the NGOs? What would be the interpretation? What would be how would the Global Fund take the proposal. So we, we, we had to really, as technicians at the time, we had to constitute a national committee to come up with a consensus figure. So we brought together all of the, all of the, the government and, and agencies as well as uh, um, uh, international organizations and the UN agencies that were, doing, that were working with, with statistics to arrive at a consensus figure. We had to go to, to, to get reports from hospitals and, 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 and health centers about HIV AIDS prevalence. So we, and the data wasn't even reliable. But we had to strike a balance. So we came up with a, with a figure around, I think, 5.2 as a consensus figure. And then people began to, 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 to challenge it. But we had to do that, and we had to, to write a justification why we had to take that, that decision to write the proposal. And so we sent that to Global Fund. And fortunately for us, uh, the proposal was accepted, and we had an argument, and we had to tell the Global Fund, this is the way we did it, and, and we, we'll see what can be done. So the power game really played out a lot when it came to statistics in Liberia on health. And, and the more powerful you were, the, the, the more voice you had, maybe to, then people could listen to you when it came to statistics. Today, we are happy the situation is quite different because we have now reliable statistics that, that, that the country can depend on for its uh, planning. So the DHS has provided us the answer to our problem. We were tested and hungry for statistics. Now we have, the country is now filled with statistics. So we, 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 very, we are very grateful to Macro for working with the Liberia Institute, um, Liberia Institute for Statistics and Geo-Information Services, LISGIS, our national statistics house to have done this study. We really, really are grateful 
We are also thankful to the U.S. government through the United States Agency for International Development, uh, the United Nations Population Fund, the United Nations Children's Fund, and the Liberian government for supporting and sponsoring the study. So today is a very historic moment that you will be able to have the first hand outcome of this important survey. We as a country have um, we have we as a country have, have accepted the data and we have begun to work with it. And we would like the world to take this uh, report very seriously and base all of the planning around health for Liberia on this uh, information that has been provided today. Without taking much of your time, I would like to thank you for coming and on behalf of the Liberian government to say to you, we are glad that you are partners of ours and we are prepared to work with every one of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gib and Mr. Varpala. And um, I'm going to start by saying I'm really happy to be here and talk to you about the results of the Liberia DHS, partly because I love to talk about the results of the DHS anywhere, but especially because Liberia was a country that I have a long relationship with in regards to the DHS. Uh, I was, from the macro point of view, from the DHS point of view, I was the manager for the 1986 DHS in Liberia, which was the first DHS in Liberia, the first DHS in Africa, and only the second DHS to be done anywhere in the world. So I, um, people at DHS tend to stay a long time because it's such a good project. So I'm giving away my age, but I was working in Liberia in 19... Uh, 86, and uh, I just, I brought the, the 1986 DHS volume to show you how, how skinny it is. We were collecting uh, much less information back then, and the new one, as you can see, is much, uh, much thicker. Um, anyway, I guess I can start by... Uh, just reviewing a little bit the outline of what I'm going to be talking about. I'm just briefly going to go through the survey background and then kind of jump into the findings on fertility, family planning, MCH, infant child mortality, HIV AIDS, and uh, women's empowerment and domestic violence, which were also included in the Liberia DHS this time. And I just have a little word I'm going to say at the end about the upcoming malaria indicator survey that we're planning to do later this year. So as far as the survey background, I have to um, be sure and uh, show our sponsors here. The survey got funding from um, a number of different organizations. Uh, as the three main donors to this project, in addition to the Liberia government, which provided a lot of, of funding and backing, uh, were USAID, UNFPA, UNICEF, and also UNDP. And in addition, I just wanted to say, in addition to providing funds for the implementation, the local costs of the survey, UNFPA also provided a lot of infrastructure for LISGIS, um, the, the Statistics Institute. They helped them to renovate the building and provided computers and I think also some vehicles. And in USAID, in addition to funding the technical assistance from MACRO, also provided, I think, 20, about 20 vehicles to LISGIS. So that was, and computers through the project. So there was a lot of capacity building and institution building that went on in this project as well. Uh, the survey itself was implemented, as uh, Mr. Varpala said, by the Liberia Institute of Statistics and Geoinformation Services, 
which I think is the longest name of any st government statistical office that I've come across in all my years of working in uh, developing countries. I think someone who was working there was trying to get them to change their name to Stats Liberia, like Stats South Africa, you know, statistics, but somehow that didn't take. So it's been called Listgis, and um, it was the same group that we worked with in the 1986 DHS. At that time, they were the st statistics department in the Ministry of Planning, but it's the same group, and it's actually headed by by somebody, um, Mr. Liberty, who worked on the first DHS as well. The um, field work, uh, oh, I should also add, obviously, LISGIS, but also the Ministry of Health was involved in the survey in designing the questionnaires, analyzing the results, and in, in the training, and very much also the National uh, AIDS Control Program. The field work started, the data collection started in the very final days of December of 2006 and went through April of 2007, so we just call it the 2007 DHS. We interviewed uh, about 7,000 households, over 7,000 women, and 6,000 men. With regard to fertility and family planning, one thing I forgot to get was a pointer, but uh, in any case, I'm just going to explain the graph has the three bars from the three different DHS surveys. So you see on the left the 1986 DHS, then the 1999-2000, and the 2007 DHS. The 1999-2000 DHS was carried out by Listgis, I don't think it was called Listgis then, but the Department of Statistics. Macro was not involved at that time, but they did get some UN funding and they carried out a, a survey on their own, a DHS on their own. So you can see, this is the um, total fertility rate, and that is a kind of summary measure of the average number of children that a woman would have if she started out at age 15 now and was subject to the age-specific fertility rates we found in the survey. And if she started now and was subject to those age-specific fertility rates, by the time she reached age 50, she would have 5.2 children on average. So that's how to interpret this graph. It's kind of a synthetic way of uh, measuring fertility. So you can see that the fertility rate has declined from 6.6 .6 children per woman uh, in the, actually I think for 1986 it was in the five years before that survey, but 6.6 .6 down to 5.2 uh, for the three years before this most recent DHS. And you can also see that the decline is steeper for the last period. The 6.2 to 5.2 is a steeper decline. It's over a shorter period of time. So that's quite good news. Now, this slide shows the West African countries where DHSs have been done, just to give you an idea of where Liberia fits in. And uh, it actually uh, has one of the lower total fertility rates you can see. I think the only ones that are lower are Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. One of the more sobering statistics we found in this most recent DHS in Liberia is the early age at childbearing. You can see from this that um, over one quarter of girls age 15 to 19 have actually given birth. They're already mothers and another 6% are pregnant with their first child. By the time girls reach age 19, half of women, half of them have had a child. So that's, that's actually very, very high level of teenage fertility. And I think that's something that perhaps really needs to be addressed. The next topic is family planning. <laughs> Um, and you can see from this slide that contraceptive use in Liberia is low. Only 11% of currently married women. This, 
This uh, statistic is usually placed on currently married women, the contraceptive prevalence rate, and it's 11% of currently married women aged 15 to 49 who are using any method of contraception. That's the, the graph, the, the bar on the left-hand side there. The good news is that almost all of that use is modern methods because 10% of women are using a modern method. So only 1% only are using a traditional method. You can see over on the right the traditional methods. The, um, another thing you can see, of course, is that the main methods used are pills and injectables. 4% of women are using pills and 4% are using injectables, 2% say they use male condoms. So those are the main methods. The, uh, even though I would say contraceptive use in Liberia is quite low, I guess I'm comparing it to some of the East African and Southern African countries I've also worked in, if you compare it to other West African countries, it actually turns out it's not so bad. It's uh, the second highest, only, to, only Ghana has a higher contraceptive prevalence rate from the surveys that we have done recently in these West African countries. This, by the way, is modern methods, so that's why it's 10% in Liberia. So this is the percent of currently married women who are using modern methods. This slide shows trends in family planning use, and at least you can see the trend is up, even though, again, I think the contraceptive use overall is quite low, but it has been increasing. In 1986, only 6% of married women were using a modern method of contraception. In 1999, 2000, that was eight, and now it's 10 in 2007. So it's a beautiful little stepwise increase. When you look at the individual methods, you can see that pill use initially increased, and then it's shown a slight decline. We've seen that in many, many other countries, especially in Africa. And uh, we think that it's probably because there's been some switching to injectables. You can see that injectables has, has continued to increase. So perhaps there's some displacement of people from uh, women from pills to injectables. The male condom also shows a slight increase, and female sterilization has been holding constant. Let me now turn to maternal and child health. And we'll start with prenatal care. This slide shows the percent of women who got antenatal care from various sources during the five years before the survey. And it relates to their most recent birth. So it, it's the women who had a birth in the five years before the survey. And we ask them, what, did you have any prenatal care for your most recent birth? you can see that only 9% of women go to get prenatal care from a doctor, and 68% get prenatal care from a nurse or a midwife, and 3% get care from a physician's assistant. All three of those types of providers are considered to be a skilled, a medically skilled provider. So that's where you see the 79% on the far right side, the pink bar, is 79% of women get prenatal care from a skilled provider, which is quite high, so that's, that's very encouraging. Only 4% of women, this small red bar, only 4% of women do not get any prenatal care at all. And 16% go to a, to a traditional midwife. As far as the place of delivery, we found that 60, over half, 61% of births take place at home. That's the bar on the right-hand side there, 61%. And 37% take place in some kind of a health facility, 27% in a public facility and 10% in a private facility. 
I found this kind of surprising because given the fact that in Liberia, almost a third of the total national population lives in Greater Monrovia, I think according to the recent census, or at least in, in the county, very close to Monrovia. So it's a very highly urbanized population at this point in time. So um, I was surprised that the proportion of facility-based births uh, wasn't a little higher than this. That's another area that perhaps could use a little bit of um, work. With regard to assistance at delivery, another important indicator from DHS surveys is the percent of births that are attended or assisted by a skilled medical provider. This slide shows that of deliveries, 5% are assisted by a doctor or a physician's assistant. 41% are assisted by a nurse or a midwife. 48% are assisted by a traditional midwife or a, a TBA, 5% by some relative or other person, and 1% get no assistance at all. So again, summing it up, there's 46% of births that are attended by a skilled provider, which again is quite low, under half, uh, and we'll see. I think this slide now shows how it compares to other West African countries. And in this regard, the, um, the attendance at delivery, Liberia doesn't show up very favorably compared to the West African countries. It's the second lowest country. It has the second lowest percent of births assisted by a skilled medical provider. So. Now we'll turn to child health, and uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the vaccinations. This slide shows the percent of children aged 12 to 23 months who have received various vaccines at any time before the survey. It's not necessarily that they've received them before 12 months of age. This is any time before the survey. DH, in the DHS surveys, we follow the WHO protocol. The interviewer asks women who have a child under five if the mother can show them the health card, the road to health card or vaccination card for the child. And if the interviewer gets the vaccination card, he, uh, she copies off the dates of the vaccinations onto the questionnaire. If the mother doesn't have the card or it got lost or whatever, then the interviewer asks the mother about each vaccine separately. Did the child receive this or this or this? So we get it two ways and we merge the data in coming up with this slide. And you can see here that 77% of children receive a BCG vaccination against tuberculosis. And, um, oh, I should also say we, we tabulate it, even though we ask the questions for all kids under five, we tabulate it for kids 12 to 23 months because those are the children who should have received all of the vaccines. If we take children under 12 months, then some of them will, won't have been old enough to have received all the vaccines. So that's why we use this. So 77% seven, have received a BCG vaccine which is usually given at birth. And you can see 75% um, of kids receive DPT-1, the first dose of DPT. But you can see there's a, a decline here. I'm just gonna walk over and show you. You can see the drop off in the DPT vaccines from 75 down to 50. And again, for polio, 83% of kids get polio-1, but then it drops off to less than half who complete the uh, cycle and get the third dose of polio. So uh, this is quite a steep drop-off. We see a drop-off, of course, in every country, but this is probably a little steeper. 63% of kids got uh, a measles vaccine. Taking all of those together, we get the percent who get all the basic immunizations. So for the 39%, uh, you see the darker blue bar here, 39% of kids can be considered to be fully immunized. That is, they got BCG, 
three doses of DPT, three doses of polio, and measles. The only one of these vaccines we don't include is polio zero because it's, um, it's not always, uh, it's usually not included. 12% of kids didn't get any vaccines, so that's also um, interesting. And again, um, when compared with the other West African countries, Liberia doesn't compare too well on the vaccination, child vaccination, it's, it's quite low compared. Most of the countries have close to 50% or more uh, vac vaccinated. This slide is about the nutritional status of kids. Again, as part of the DHS, we, we weigh and measure all children under five. We use special scales, UNICEF scales, and special height boards that the teams have to lug around in the field. And uh, we, we spend a couple of days training the interviewers exactly how to take the readings, how to record it. Then we put it into a computer program and compared the status of children um, on three basic indicators. We compare it to the WHO reference, international reference population of children who are considered to be well nourished. We're using, we switched a couple of years ago to use the new standard reference population for those of you who, who know that, that it changed. So in this graph, the blue bars refer to moderate malnutrition, undernutrition, and the red bars refer to severe undernutrition. And the three indicators that we calculate are stunting, wasting, and underweight. Stunting refers to children who are too short for their age. So they have not, they have not, uh, grown enough compared to the age, that, that, what they should be for their age. Stunting usually is related to chronic under malnutrition. So it continues long enough to actually cause the child not to thrive, not to grow to, the, to his or her full potential. The second indicator is wasting, and that refers to those who are too thin for their height. So they're really um, skinny. And that is usually taken to refer to a more acute undernutrition. It can be because the child's been ill recently. And underweight is a kind of an amalgamation of the two that's too thin for their age. So you can see from the graph that 39% of children under five are stunted. That is, they're considered to be too short for their age. 8% are wasted, and 19% are underweight. We asked a few questions related to malaria, um, and one of them was about ownership of mosquito nets in the household. So this slide shows results from a, another survey that I haven't mentioned so far, that is the Liberia Malaria Indicator Survey that the Ministry of Health undertook in 2005. And that survey showed that 18% of households owned a mosquito net of any kind. This is treated or untreated. They just asked, uh, this slide just shows any kind of a net. And in the 2007 DHS, we found that had gone up to 30% of households that owned a net. So that's quite a nice jump. It is still short of the 60% that was set as the target at the Abuja conference. So there's still a ways to go. And as I said, I'm going to talk a little bit about the upcoming malaria indicator survey. For um, turning now to child mortality and maternal mortality, this slide shows the um, results from, uh, related to childhood mortality levels. This information comes from the birth history that we ask women. We ask women for a complete history of all their births, when they took place, the sex, whether they're still living, and if not, how old they were when they died. So this is how we calculate this information. The, we calculated for five different 
age periods. Neonatal mortality refers to deaths in the first month of life. And you can see that the neonatal mortality rate we calculated was 32 per thousand live births. Postneonatal mortality is between one month and one year of age, one to 12 months of age. Infant mortality is the, the proportion of children who die before they reach exact age one, 12 months of age. And the infant mortality rate is 71 as we calculated it. Under five mortality was 110. So 110 of, of 1,000 births in Liberia, 110 will not make it to their fifth birthday. If you look at it another way, you could say 11% of kids don't make it to their first, fifth birthday. Nevertheless, there's been, a, this represents quite a, a big decline in mortality, child mortality over time. Again, because we have a complete birth history for women, we can go back in time. The rates I showed you in the previous slide referred to the five years before the survey, but we can go back five to 10 years or, and 10 to 14 years before the survey and calculate the same rates. And that's what we've done in this slide it shows that the infant mortality rate has declined from 139 to 71 that it is now. So 10 to 15 years ago, in 1992 to 1996, it was about 139, and it's declined quite precipitously in the recent time period. The same is true for the under five mortality. So there has been quite a sizable decline. This is also true when we compare the results of the 2007 DHS with previous DHS surveys. You still see almost exactly the same amount of decline in the under five mortality of kids. I think back 20 years ago, it was really very high rates of child mortality, and they are now much more moderate, is the way I would sort of interpret that. Just a... Um, a bit of uh, differentials in mortality. You can see um, the red bars refer to the infant mortality rates, and the blue bars refer to the under five mortality rates. And you can see, as is so true with almost everything we do in the DHS surveys, m mother's education has a big relationship. We can't say it's a cause and effect relationship, but it's a very strong association with, uh, with child mortality here, but also with almost every other indicator we produce. You can see that the red bars drop off as mother's education increases. Also, the blue bars drop off as, uh, from mothers with no education down to uh, mothers with secondary education. I'll say a word about maternal mortality. In this DHS, we included our maternal mortality module, and that consists of asking women about all their brothers and sisters that they've ever had, all the children who were born from their same mother. And then we ask, uh, for those who are still alive, we ask how old they are, and if their siblings have died, we ask how old they were when they died. So it's kind of like getting a birth history for their mothers. And from that, we, we can estimate uh, maternal mortality ratio. If a sister has died in the childbearing ages, we ask the respondent, was your sister pregnant when she died? Did she die during delivery? Or did she die just after delivery? And if any of those questions are yes, it becomes a maternal death. It's, it's quite a crude way of measuring it, but maternal mortality is pretty impossible to measure. It's, um, even though the levels are far too high in most countries, it's, um, it's still a very rare event to have a maternal death, and it's very difficult statistically to measure it. That's why the rates are usually quoted per 100,000. So from this method, we measured uh, a maternal mortality ratio of 994 deaths 
per 100,000 births, and that refers to a seven-year period before the survey. We have to take a seven-year period because, again, the numbers are so small that the sampling errors just get very wide and the confidence intervals are, are big. They're still very big with this, with this estimation as well, but this is a high level of maternal mortality. <clears throat> We asked a few questions related to women's empowerment, and we included a domestic violence module as well. So I have a few slides on that. This slide shows the type of payment for working women and working men, because we did interview men in this survey. So we're comparing there for working, well, women are shown in red and men are shown in blue. And we show um, the proportion who were paid in cash only, in cash and in kind, or in kind only, are not paid. So th from this slide, we can see that women are more likely than men to be not paid at all. You can see on the far right, 35% of working women work with no pay, compared to only 26% of men. <clears throat> We also asked women about whether they participated in certain decisions that are made in the household. And there were four types of decisions. We asked if they participate, if they help to make decisions with regard to borrowing money, making major household purchases, making purchases for daily household living, and making visits to relatives, a family, or friends. And this is confined just to currently married women, and it shows the percent of those women who participate in that decision. They could either say that they make the decision entirely on their own, their husband makes the decision entirely on his own, or they make it jointly. And if they said that they made the decision or they made it jointly with their husbands, they were considered in this graph so they participate in the decision. And you can see that women tend to be more involved in decisions regarding daily household purchases, I guess things like food and supplies for the children or whatever. And they're less likely to participate in decisions regarding borrowing money. So um, only 58% participate in that. But then taking all four together, you can see that Almost half of women participate in all four of those decisions. With regard to violence, we asked, um, the domestic violence module is actually um, a set of questions, and when we include it in the DHS, we have to make a number of alterations. For one thing, we only select one woman in each household to be asked these questions. This is in order to protect the woman against having someone else in the household who was interviewed talk about the types of questions and perhaps cause um, some problems if there's an abusive uh, man in the house or or whatever. So we have a little way in which we can randomly select one of, in households that have more than one woman, we have a little way of randomly selecting only one woman to be asked these questions. Another thing is that we insist on absolute privacy. In many countries, uh, you may know women, the neighbor comes over or the mother-in-law or the friend or somebody is sitting in listening to the interview. And even though we tell the interviewers, please try to get rid of the other people. I've been in situations listening and the woman says, no, 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 she knows all my secrets. She can stay, she can stay. So you end up conducting the interview with the other person present, although usually they can, if the interviewer is good, usually she can get rid of the, uh, the interference, but sometimes there's someone else there. And in that case, this section is completely skipped because they will not ask these questions if anyone else is present. And again, that's just to protect the woman. So we asked women about any kind of violence and um, we, 
we, uh, well, I guess actually we ask about three different types of violence. We ask about physical violence, emotional violence, and sexual violence. So those are sort of the three categories. We found that 44% of women said that they had been, uh, had, had experienced some kind of physical violence since they were age 15. We exclude physical violence under 15 because we don't want to get spankings that the mother, you know, her mother may have spanked her for doing something bad when she was two, and we don't, we're not interested in that. Um, that um, and of those 44% who said they had experienced physical violence, six in 10 women said that they were abused by a current or former husband or marital partner of some sort. 10% uh, of women told us that their first sexual intercourse was forced against their will, which is a very high level. And 18% of women said that they had experienced, at some time, they had experienced sexual violence. If we just look at women who uh, have been married, then we're uh, talking about violence from their husbands or marriage partners, then um, we can see here that 36% of women said that they had experienced some kind of emotional violence. This is things, uh, I think the questions say, you know, has your husband, does he humiliate you in front of other people? Is he very jealous of you and maybe won't let you go out on your own? Those are, does he call you names? And that's, that's um, emotional violence. So uh, over th one third of women who, have been ma who are currently married say that they have experienced this kind of emotional violence. And almost as many have experienced physical violence. That includes any kind of slapping, beating, kicking, hitting with a, an instrument. And 11% have experienced some kind of sexual violence. Very high levels, very high levels indeed. So turning now to HIV AIDS, this is a slide on knowledge of HIV prevention methods. And again, women are, the red bars refer to women and the blue bars refer to men. We're a little bit sexist, I guess, but it's easier to remember that way. And you can see, uh, we ask about things like, uh, can, uh, is it possible to prevent HIV transmission by using condoms every time you have sex? Or limiting sex to just one uninfected partner? Those are the kinds of questions we ask. And you can see here that knowledge of HIV prevention methods is not uh, terribly widespread. Only about half of women know about the, say that they know about these transmission methods. And for every one, the men are more likely to mention it than women. You can see the blue bars are always higher than the red bars. Even asking about abstaining from sex, only 47% of women said it's possible to reduce the chance of getting HIV by abstaining. So this is quite low proportions. Looking at uh, sexual partners, we can see that um, in general, women report fewer sexual partners than men. I think this is true in almost every country that we've done these surveys in. And this is true whether it's uh, partners in the past 12 months or lifetime partners. So among uh, those who had sex in the last 12 months, 7% of women and 21% of men said they had two or more sexual partners in the last 12 months. And over the course of their lifetimes, women said they had an average of about four sexual partners compared to about 10 for men. Just a... Um, Slide on uh, condom use with higher risk sex. This, uh, again, the red bars refer to women and the blue to men. And um, this relates to higher risk sex, which is defined as having sex with someone who's not a spouse or a cohabiting partner. 
you can see that among those who had sex in the last year, a third of women said they had higher risk sex compared to over half of the men, 52% of the men. And again, among those who said they had higher risk sex, condom use at the last, we asked them, did you use a condom the last time you had higher risk sex? And only 14% of women said they had compared to 26% of men. So there's little ways to go there too with condom use. Uh, as part of the DHS in Liberia, we measured HIV prevalence. I um, just want to say a word about how we do this. Um, this is something where we, we train interviewers to take a drop of blood from the finger. So they do a, they're trained to take a finger prick of blood on a filter paper. For, uh, first of all, they administer an informed consent to the respondent, explain what they're planning to do, and ask permission to take a, a spot of blood. And if they get permission, they make a filter paper, they label it correctly, they're trained how to store it and dry it. Um, and the filter papers are brought back to the central laboratory for testing. And I wanted to say also that in Liberia, as in some of the other countries, this involved not only training the interviewer, ordering the supplies, training the interviewers, getting ethical approval, but in Liberia, it also involved getting the laboratory ready and set up because they had no, um, we use an ELISA machine to do the HIV testing. And there was no working ELISA machine available in any of the laboratories in, uh, in Liberia. So we actually worked with a, a lab that had uh, kind of fallen into a little bit of disrepair, and we had to make sure that they had a ready supply of electricity, which was not uh, always easy. Uh, like Monrovia is just getting back onto a power grid. When we first started the survey, there was no, no public electricity available. Everybody had generators. So we had to make sure that this laboratory had a supply of electricity for the machinery and the freezers and the fridges. We provided a fridge and a freezer and an ELISA reader and a lot of the other equipment and worked with them, trained the lab techs how to do the, um, the ELISA testing. So um, I also wanted to say that the response rate for the HIV testing was quite good. We got, out of all the eligible respondents, 84% of them, we got blood from 84% of the eligible respondents. Now, a lot of people say, oh, that means 16% refused. But that's not the case, because most of those people were not available. They were not home, and we never even interviewed them. So I'm not sure what the refusal rate is, but it was a lot lower than that. So that's quite a good level. And as you can see in this um, slide, we found a prevalence rate of 1.5% among adults in Liberia um, age 15 to 49. As in most all of the countries that where we've done HIV testing, it's higher among women than men. 1.8% of women and 1.2% of men were positive. This is a slide on uh, HIV prevalence by residents. You can see that it's higher among, um, well, as I said before, it's higher among women than men. But you can also see that it's higher in urban areas than in rural areas. So for example, in, um, among women, 2.8% of urban women are HIV positive compared to 1.1% of rural women. And the same is true for men. But again, in both urban and rural areas, women are more likely to be infected than men. This is a last slide, and it's on um, HIV prevalence rates by age. As in most countries, you can see that women are more likely to be infected, younger women are more likely to be infected than men. And in most countries, this begins to change at the older ages. In Liberia, it doesn't actually cross over until age group 45 to 49, when men are slightly more likely to be infected than women. 
Um, and there is some fluctuation. This is partly because the rates for Liberia are so low that you, you know, these small, small changes, we, you have to be careful not to over-interpret these small differences. So that's the DHS findings, and I just wanted to say a little word about um, we're planning to I implement a malaria indicator survey, perhaps starting later this, this year. This is a joint project of the Malaria Control Program at the Ministry of Health, the Statistics Office Listus, and MACRO. We're uh, planning to interview about um, over 3,000 women, and we're planning to do anemia and malaria parasite testing on over 300 kids under five. It will we'll cover all the basic malaria indicators, bed nets, uh, um, intermittent preventive treatment among pregnant women, and uh, treatment of children with, uh, with fever, whether they receive anti-malarials. So I think I'll now turn over and have Hannah talk to you a little bit about our dissemination activities. Good morning. Um, Annie and I had the opportunity to travel to Liberia in the end of July to work on the national seminar and um, do the dissemination of the final report and some of the materials that you had provided to you when you came in today. Um, our work during this time focused on working with the speakers who would be presenting the results. So we spent about a week and a half meeting with them and going over very much the same PowerPoint slides you saw today. Um, we worked with individuals from the Ministry of Health, from the National Malaria Control Program, from the National AIDS Control Program, and also from Lysitius. And they were responsible for presenting the results, but some of them aren't, you know, the world's best speakers or they hadn't, haven't had lots of opportunities to get up in front of people and, and use um, presentation skills. So it was a wonderful opportunity to work with them and, and develop these skills and we really did see some promising results. There was one woman from the Ministry of Health who just did an amazing presentation and you saw how much work and time and energy she put into it and, and you really could see it when she gave the presentation. So it was a very... Um, positive uh, national seminar that we had. It took place on, um, pull it down, okay, on July 30th uh, at the U University of Liberia Auditorium, and it was attended by representatives from various UN agencies, from, of course representatives from USAID, from the Ministry of Health and Education, um, also from, uh, from LISGIS as well. And the keynote address was to be presented by the Vice President of the Republic of Liberia, but unfortunately he was unable to attend due to some rearranging of schedule, but he was able to send his Chief of Staff, um, Mr. St Sam Steve Kwa, who gave an amazing um, keynote address, just a very encouraging and powerful uh, presentation. We had approximately 125 people who were in attendance from a variety of UN agencies and local and international NGOs. Um, as well as the press and people from the University of Liberia. Um, and as I said, we gave a presentation, very a longer version of what you saw today, but very similar, just providing, presenting the results. And we also had opportunities for question and answer discussions, which were very lively, and people had the opportunity to question the data and, and find out more about how the data was collected and, and how we got the results that we did. Um, the, minister, the chief medical officer, uh, Dr. Don, from the Ministry of Health, was able to give the closing remarks as well as um, Mr. Liberty from LISGIS. So all in all, it was a great day. It was also an opportunity for us um, to disseminate the materials that you um, saw today. We have the HIV fact sheet, um, which you saw, which provides information and differentials on the HIV prevalence as well as the key findings. Um, and if anyone's interested, these are also available on the website, uh, measuredhs.com, as well as a PDF version of the final report. Um, we only brought a few copies of the final report because it is so large, but those are available online, and they're also available if you want to request a hard copy of it. It's free. You just um, submit a form, and we can send that to you. Um, additionally, we have some further dissemination activities that we are preparing to do in Liberia. Um, we, were, we are planning to be, work with key stakeholders in the Ministry of Health and various NGOs 
to give them the tools to use the data. As was um, spoken about earlier, Liberia was desperately in need of data, and the DHS provides that data, but um, players in the Ministry of Health also need the tools to be able to use the data. And so we have plans to go back and have small group meetings with different departments in the Ministry of Health and NGOs um, on how to read and interpret the DHS tables, um, on how to disseminate the data, and discussions on how stakeholders will apply the DHS data to programs and policies. Um, additionally, we, we hope to work on developing specific dim dissemination materials focused on youth in Liberia. As you saw some from some of the indicators, teenage pregnancy is a problem, HIV knowledge is low. There are several indicators that are s focused on youth and um, activities around that. So we will be doing more planning on these with the Ministry of Health and with USAID in the coming months. Um, so if you have any interest in these or you know NGOs that would be interested in, in working with us, um, please feel free to contact us. All right, thank you. Thank you three for um, great presentations. Do you guys want to move in for that? Um, at this time, I would just like to open up the floor for questions for any of the speakers. Uh, as I said, we've, we've got the camera rolling, so wait for, a, wait for a microphone to come around. Uh, Rebecca, right there next to you. Uh, thank you all. Um, this is Karen Cavanaugh from USAID. Uh, I'd be very interested since Dr. or Mr. Varpella talked about the lack of data and you presented very interesting findings. When you did this presentation in Liberia, what were the findings that were most striking for policymakers and were there any aspects of the findings that were controversial? Vaccination. Vaccination. Yeah. <laughs> I remember the vaccination. The, the De the chief medical officer, Dr. Don, was very um, interested in our findings on vaccination because they had just done a surveillance system of vaccination and found that somewhat close to 80 percent, I believe, of children were fully vaccinated, and we found 39 percent, I believe. And so there was a lot of discussion on why the numbers were different. Um, that was one. Of, that was one I remember because it was a very animated discussion. <laughs> I, I think some um, people were surprised at the maternal mortality ratio because it was um, considerably higher than what had been estimated from the 99-2000 survey. But there, as the re main report points out, there are different uh, methods of estimation and both are very, very rough estimates. So I don't think it's statistically significant, that increase. but. Some people. I think there was also a concern about HIV AIDS prevalence rate because uh, I think, as I said in the past, the, the government had this uh, figure that, that, that was out there. And I think the intention was that uh, the, the higher the rate, the more money the country would get. So it was quite uh, disturbing for many people to see that it was less than two. <laughs> Uh, right up here in the front. I have the microphone. Thank you. Uh, Samuel Adeni, John. I'm, I'm still interested in the HIV prevalence rate. Um, what sort of figures did the government have before, and what, who provided those figures? For a post-conflict country, even 1.22 percent, that's pretty low. I, I wonder how confident you are about the present figures. I think the previous estimate from the antenatal um, surveillance system was 5.2 yeah, 5. Yeah. 5. or, um, yeah, that, that was lower. I think, well, first of all, I think in every country, we've, uh, DHS has implemented HIV testing in over 30 countries so far, and I think in every country ex with one possible exception, we have found lower rates than what had been estimated through the antenatal system. And that was a cause of a lot of uh, controversy, especially with UNAIDS recently. And I think last November, UNAIDS actually took the decision to reduce the, their estimates of the number of people infected <clears throat> and adopt the survey estimates. 
So that having been said, it is a little bit puzzling about the differences. One difference between the um, the rate in the survey and the rate from the ANC. The ANC is based on a small number of mostly urban health centers, and the DHS is was taken among uh, women and men uh, throughout the country in uh, 300, almost 300 sample points throughout the country. So I think it's a more reliable figure. The, um, the, the other difference is that we use, um, we do the testing in the laboratory, and I believe the antenatal rate is based on rapid tests, which in, some, in some studies, the rapid tests have been shown to be a little unreliable um, slightly as compared to, say, a central testing. But, but I, I thought you mentioned about a range, even though it's, it's, it's at that level, but it, the range varies from region to region. Mm -hmm. There are some regions where it's, it's high, but the national uh, rate is that, that amount. But l let me just hasten to talk a little bit about um, we are not complacent because it's, it is low. If you look at a trend in post-conflict countries, there's less mobility of people. People are confined. There's, a, there's less interaction among the population. So definitely the rate may be low. But now that we are now in a the, in the situation where the, the roads have been open and, and movement is rapid, if we don't if we don't take the appropriate actions, it could very much accelerate in a very short time. So we, we, we are very mindful about that as well. Just to, to add a little more to that point too, um, I think it also mentions in the final report that the rates from the neighboring countries are also quite low from the surveys. Uh, Sierra Leone and uh, Cote d'Ivoire also have, I think, quite low rates. I can't remember them offhand. Guinea, 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 yeah. Guinea, Guinea, Guinea. and Sierra have low rates. Plus, we also uh, found that I think it was 98% of Liberian men said that they were circumcised. And as you may have read in the recent findings, studies have shown that that can have a protective effect. So perhaps that's, you know, related. <clears throat> Before we move on to the next question, what you mentioned the variation among the rates throughout the country. How how high how high were they in some areas? Monrovia is I think Monrovia was close to five and there was one one region that's point nine. Yeah. Uh, and the the higher region the one of the higher regions is the region that borders Cote d'Ivoire, which has one of the higher prevalences for West Africa. Um, so that that could be one factor. Okay. Uh, way in the back, Rebecca. Thank you. I'm doing Luwali, Africa's Health in 2010 at AED. Um, the results for the child health uh, section of the DHS are quite encouraging. But my question is related to violence among women, especially the child sexual abuse component. I noticed that DHS only deals with 15 and above. We do know that in Africa, child sexual abuse is a big issue mm. and is shrouded in a culture of silence. And I'm wondering whether this is something that you would like to look into in the near future so that we can catch this population of children that have been abused, particularly in the eastern and southern parts of Africa where there is the belief that a man who is HIV positive, if he had sex with a virgin, could be killed. And that is still being perpetrated in society. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I know that is an important issue. And perhaps that is behind the high levels that we see of women who say that their first sexual experience was forced. Perhaps that's some, uh, that's child sexual abuse, perhaps, if they were under 15, especially when it happened. Because we're, we may be interviewing them at age 15, but 
their first sex could have been at 13 or 8, and they were violated. So that could be something behind it. Um, we do. We did in um, in Liberia. We did include a module of questions that UNICEF often asks about child discipline. It's not sexual abuse, but it gets into physical. It talks about: Do you feel you you need to um, discipline your children? And in the past, have you have you done this or this or this? How do you discipline your child? And it does ask about beatings. Uh, so that gets into the physical aspect, not the sexual aspect. It could be something that we would um, think about for future. It's a very, very difficult situation, though, because if you're talking about young children, then you can't ask them. Uh, you would have to, I guess you would have to ask the other family members if they have been violating their children, which... Uh, there, there may be a lot of underreporting, I would think, of that aspect. Um, and it also gets into, I mean, we're, we're just kind of skirting some of the legal aspects when we ask about, even about domestic violence. But if we did find uh, a parent who said that they had abused their child, especially sexually, then I think we would be obligated to do something about it. So it, it gets a little bit... Um, <laughs> on the edge there, but I, it may lend itself better to a special study that that might uh, that might be able to focus more on it and take care of some of those aspects of it. Maybe let me, let me speak to that issue. Hmm. Well, what, what is what has happened in Liberia over the, the last uh, two or three years is that uh, the Ministry of Gender and Development has been at the forefront of advocating for the protection of children and the rights of women. And what we begin to realize uh, over this period is that there has been an increased reporting on sexual violence against children, the girls' children especially. So I don't know whether uh, the, the, the reporting, uh, whether it indicates an increase in sexual violence or, or it's happening because the people are getting more aware. But we haven't, there hasn't been an empirical study to find out exactly the situation. But I do know that, that there has been a lot of uh, cases reported. And in fact, uh, there has been um, some laws enacted now to protect women. And the inheritance bill is out there. I know there has been a, a law passed uh, uh, making sure that anyone found violating the rights of Sexually, the rights of a child, uh, that person uh, should, be, should not be uh, sent out of prison. But, so the bill is, is no longer billable. It's, the crime is no longer billable in Liberia. So there is a, but uh, certainly there's a need to look into that more, more scientifically. But it's the, the fact is that people are beginning to report it in, in, um, uh, now than ever before. <laughs> All right up here in the front now. Hi, um, my name is Miranda Erskine, and I'm here more as an individual party and just someone who's interested in development work in Africa. And um, I should say thank you for the information because as, as a young person really wanting to make an impact, um, it's difficult when information's not out there and you don't know exactly what the needs are. Um, so I, I have two questions. Um, one of the questions that I had was about mortality rates. Based on your experience in Liberia, what do you attribute um, these mortality rates of whether it's maternal mortality rates or in children, what do you attribute those to? Um, also, um, I recently read um, a survey, I think, that came out in May um, about the mental health um, state of ex-combatants in Liberia. And I can't um, remember whether it was something that you did, but um, uh, I was just wondering how, why that wasn't included um, in, in your study, because I believe that that's something that is um, very important. Um. I guess the child mortality rates, um, we, we didn't ask 
causes of death. So we don't know exactly what is killing children. But just looking at some of the um, some of the other results, I could say that since the immunization rates are very low, the percent of children, it's only 39% of children who are fully vaccinated. So that could have an effect. I believe malaria, I mean, Mr. Varpalam knows this much better, but I'm sure malaria is a major cause of death among kids in, in Liberia. So I think we may see further declines in child mortality as the bed net program and, and malaria program gets underway and gets, gets really moving. Another thing that the survey showed was the high levels of malnutrition among kids under five. So that could be another strong component there that's causing the, the mortality. Um, again, maternal mortality, I would assume that it's because mothers tend to give birth at home without assistance and they need to be, they need to be brought in and have adequate care and be screened for, for risks. <clears throat> Can I, can like I add my voice to that? Please. Thank you. <laughs> now, there are several reasons. L let me look at first the, the child mortality. There are three major causes. As, as you rightly said, malaria is the leading cause of both mortality and mo mobility. Then followed by acute respiratory infection and diarrhea. Those are the three giant killers of children in our country. Now, let's look at maternal mortality, why the high uh, increase? This is one area that, that is really alarming. The last DHS that was done, in, I think uh, 1999 or somewhere around there, put a figure around 550 plus. And today it, it's, it's almost 1,000 uh, uh, death per, per 100,000 as reported. Why is this so? There are many reasons why. One. The uh, premium health worker, the, our, our health worker to population ratio is about, about 0 0.03. So for every thousand people in Liberia, we have 0 0.03 trained health workers. If you, if you take it further, I mean, let's look at medical doctors for instance. Before the war, we had over 550 medical doctors. Today, our, our statistics shows that we have about 221 of those people present. Out of that number, we have 56 who are Liberian doctors and only 34 are practicing. So we have a huge, huge gap of trained health workers. Now, what is responsible for this, for this, for the, for the low gap, for this, for this huge shortage of health workers? our training institutions collapse. Our medical school will put up uh, a minimum of, a maximum of, of, of five students after every two years. With that rate, it's gonna take us over 20 years to, to pick up again. Our public training schools, we had uh, uh, five uh, pre-war uh, training schools uh, to train uh, May wives and physician assistants and lab techs. Today, every, every, those, those institutions broke down. We are now in the process of revamping three of them to restart. One is starting in September mm -hmm. now, and one will pick up in, 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 in January next year. There's a high teenage pregnancy rate in the country. The roles are terrible, so the referral system is really not functioning. With the help of the World Bank, we are trying this year to get 21 ambulances to, to, to be provided at all of our medical, uh, our, our, our hospitals in the rural areas. So there are, there are a lot of array of reasons why we have this high uh, maternal mortality rate. I mean, I just wanted to name a few of them, but there are several reasons. Mm -hmm. The family, family, the reproductive health program is not functioning to its to its to its to, 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 to its expectation, you know. So it's a huge huge problem. Many of the the male wives that are traditionally providing services are not trained to know at what time they should be able to ref, to refer uh, pregnant women to the hospitals. 
they don't have delivery kits. So, so my, we can name the, the, the issues as the, the problems, but we're trying to address that. We, now we have a strategic plan for maternal mortality. Uh, as part of the plan, we, we are working between now and 2010 to put 15 comprehensive obstetric emergency care centers throughout the country and train our, our, our doctors and, and PAs. We are in the process of what we call shifting tasks so that some of the, the tasks that doctors are performing could be passed on to, 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 to PAs, uh, physician assistants, and to, to nurses. And then nurses can pass on some of their tasks to community health workers. Is it, is it possible for community health workers, for instance, to be able to, to provide uh, malaria drugs at a community level? These are some of the measures that we, we're trying to take to address this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, no, we, um, we, we don't actually ask that. We, we ask if they have ever been tested before. And if so, did they receive the results? Because one of the standard um, HIV AIDS indicators is the proportion of people who have gone for voluntary uh, testing and have received their own results. But we always preface that with, I don't want to know the results. I just want to know if you received the results. Because we don't, it, it's, it's uh, again, it's very sensitive, dicey to be asking, um, can you tell me, please, are you positive or negative? I mean, that's um, that gets into a lot of ethical issues there as well. So we don't typically ask for the results. And in the Liberia case, we told them in the informed consent that we would like to take a pinprick of blood and test it for HIV, but we told them that we would not be able to give them the results of their test and that it's anonymous. So we, um, we actually go through a lot of um, processes to make sure that the confidentiality of individuals is maintained. So when we link it to the rest of the survey results, there's no names attached. We've destroyed the questionnaire cover pages that has that information. And so we can then no longer find a given respondent and know their results. So. <clears throat> Oh, uh, yes. Well, we, we do also tell them that if they want to know their HIV status, we can tell them where to go to get their, their results. In some countries, we give them a voucher to take. In Liberia, the Liberia Ethics uh, Committee said all VCT is free, so giving them a voucher makes it look like they're getting something that other people don't get, so they, they nix the voucher idea. But, yeah, we tell them where they can go to be tested. Yes, right here. Uh, Duale Africa 2010. Mine is not a, not a question, but I just want to uh, get back to the HIV AIDS prevalence. I think about five years ago, my colleague and I from Tulane wrote a paper using the uh, HIV AIDS data in Mozambique and Angola. So I think Liberia need to really take this. The level is low, but as a post-conflict country, this is the time to really uh, strengthen the effort so that you keep it at that uh, low level. Because what happened in Mozambique and Angola is that uh, post-conflict, when people start to move and try to mix the uh, factor to, for the spread of AIDS, 
will be uh, uh, come into effect. So it's good for Liberia to second the HIV AIDS uh, prevention and control effort. Do you want to say something about your future plans or anything? I will just let Okay. Okay, right in the back. Hi, uh, Emmanuel Wokolo. My question is, where I didn't notice any questions on other chronic diseases, and we all tend to talk about HIV and everything else, but we forget the rest of the chronic diseases, which are actually quite serious in many uh, countries. And is that are you planning to do? And then that survey of chronic diseases, or was it that you, they, you didn't consider them important enough in, uh, in Liberia? I can speak on behalf of DHS that we have, um, we have moved a little bit in that area in some of the countries where chronic, adult chronic diseases, you're talking about adults and things like, um, and we have tried to do some other kinds of testing one that is fairly easy is to measure blood pressure to try to find out the level of hypertension because, see, when you're doing a survey, you have to do things that are kind of easy in the context of a one-shot survey. One other thing that would be very nice to do is to try to measure blood glucose levels to, um, or, but that require or even cholesterol levels of some sort, but that requires taking blood in the morning and after or, or after fasting and so you get into some sort of difficult situations in that regard so we're trying things that do lend themselves to to um, somewhat easier methods of measuring and blood pressures one in South Africa and I think in one other country we measured peak flow blowing into to try to measure uh, lung function um, we have done some other tests, but usually on a small basis. In Tashkent in Uzbekistan, we did a lot of chronic diseases. I think we did test for, uh, I can't remember, cholesterol, and uh, we did a bunch of, I think, sexually transmitted, other sexually transmitted diseases and things of that nature. So, so we are trying to do, we do weigh and measure um, women and in some cases men. So we do get measures of obesity and, and um, things of that nature. But mm -hmm. uh, back here. Someone earlier asked about um, mental health and whether you looked at mental health. And uh, I know this is a largely a maternal and child health uh, survey, but I wonder, based on your experience uh, applying this in Liberia in a post-conflict setting, whether that leads you to think of any special questions that you might want to include in future DHS surveys in post-conflict settings. So, for example, someone referred to the recent um, study of mental health among post-combatants and experience of violence by men as well as women. Just thinking, maybe asking about combatant status, whether that's something that would be helpful in a post-conflict mm -hmm. setting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was realizing that we hadn't answered that because we didn't, I, I wasn't aware of that study and we didn't have anything to do with it. But yes, I think, um, I think something might be interesting along those lines. The one set of questions we did ask was whether people had been displaced in the household. <clears throat> we I can't quite remember how we worded it, but something about did you have you stayed in this household the whole time, or were you displaced, and were you living in a camp or out of the country? Some of those questions related more to migration and displacement, um, but we didn't really move into the area of mental. Maybe I can address a little bit of mental health. Um, one of the things. Let me just say that. Uh, we have up to now done about 16 different studies just uh, in the health field uh, over the last two years, which is really a lot. But what we're trying to do is now begin uh, to take actions. I think uh, we, we've done a lot of, a lot of studies, 
Now, the mental health study that was done, uh, I think, costs uh, as high as 40% um, of mental illness in the country. So what we are doing now is we, we're working with all of the partners. We have a national mental health team, a uh, task, task team that is working. We are drafting a policy on mental health. And I recall some of the, the crucial issues uh, that we are talking about addressing is, is, is to take a, a drastic um, uh, diversion from the usual uh, the, the post the, the pre-war mental health program that was more facility based meaning that when people had problem they had to be moved to a big rehab center and now we're beginning to realize that perhaps it's good to to put more emphasis on the preventive side to make sure that when, when you when you see someone with 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 a depression case for instance you begin to inter, to 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 tackle the problem from that stage. So, so we're talking more about a community-based approach to the problem. So we're doing the, the policy, and then we're also doing the plan to address the, the mental health issue in the country. There was a very big mental health facility in the country before, but that, is, that has broken down, and it's going to take a lot of money to rebuild that kind of facility. And it's the, 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 the whole issue of stigma, we want to get, get to address that issue as well. Now, for the HIV AIDS that, was, uh, talk, that you talk about, uh, Dr. Dwale, um, we are very concerned about that. And so we have taken uh, a lot of uh, positive actions. You know we have our national health plan that, that, that talks about, that has what we call the basic package of health services that is talking about integration more than, than the, the vertical uh, approach. And currently we are working on our community health um, uh, policy and a community health strategic plan that gives more, that puts more emphasis on prevention. We just got through with our, the, the, the communication strategy for, 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 for our national health plan and the communication strategy is addressing each disease and looking at the target population and with the, with the right approach to address the issue. So with all of these in motion, we are hoping that we will not only halt, but we will reverse the situation. And, and we are trying to make, for instance, some of the services, HIV services and malaria services to be integrated. It's no longer going to be the, the, the usual vertical program. But one of the actions we have taken using the Global Fund and all of our partners, the support they are, they are bringing forth is we've tried to, to ensure that we have a standardized incentive package of all health workers in the country. That is working, and we have moved one step. We got uh, funding from uh, Clinton Foundation and using the money from the Global Fund and using the government resources to attract health workers to work outside of the country and make sure they are available to, throughout the country. Because in the, in the past, for, let's take uh, the Global Fund, HIV AIDS. HIV AIDS uh, support was only targeting people who provide HIV AIDS services. And we've said no. We can use the HIV AIDS money to recruit people to provide a comprehensive service for everyone. And that is, that is the approach and that we are taking. And over the last year, we were able to put 1,500 workers uh, uh, throughout the country. And these were people who were not working for government. Some of them were doing their private services, and we have, been try, we have tried to, to recruit and put them. We are working on, on the plan this year to, to recruit 50 international doctors uh, to put throughout the country to provide services. Um, Francois from World Vision. <clears throat> I have just a, qu a quick question. Looking at the DHS you did in 1986 and the one you just concluded, there is uh, in between, there is uh, the 14 year old war, the 14 year, year war. Um, are there any indicators that might have been ag aggravated by this war? Thank you. 
I'm, I'm sure most, most all of them were affected in some way. Um, and I think if you, if you look in the report, you can see some of the graphs that show, because there was a, a survey in the middle of the war, the 1999-2000 DHS. So you do get to see kind of a picture of, of what, was, what was happening. But I'm sure in, in parts of the country especially, services were disrupted and... Um, and and, th and people were displaced, so that that had to have affected the um, the results that we're getting. It's difficult to see exactly what was what was caused by what, but um, not sure whether. Uh... But Claire, let's look at maternal death. In 1999, maternal death was quoted by DHS at the time at uh, 550 something. For hundred thousand, today is is as high as almost a thousand. So definitely, there was some some impact of the war on 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 the the statistics. Definitely so. But what we're trying to do now is is to see, for instance, for maternal death, is to see why is it so high? What are the the, the real causes? Even though from observations and other data, we we have we have some pointers. But as we go from region to region, we begin to find out why, and, and we, we, we have to do that to make sure why is this high in this region, in this other region is low. But if you delve into, the, into it uh, closely, you find out, for instance, in the southeastern region, it was, it's very high because, uh, from my own um, uh, uh, point of view, because one, the roads are impossible. Uh, during the, the rains, say from uh, May to uh, up to October, is is right now. There's no mobility in that area. Secondly, it's an area where you don't have uh, a lot of trained health workers. For instance, let's take one one county, Grand Cru. Grand Cru had only one male wife in the whole county. No doctor. Yeah, it, it has one health center that is being uh, quoted as, considered as a hospital. There's no surgical, surgery going on. So all of these are some of the reasons, but definitely they had, the war impacted the, 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 the data. All right, um, I guess, I'm, I'm sorry, I think we've pretty much run out of time. Um, but I'd like to thank um, everyone for all these great questions and especially thank our panelists and um, uh, not the extended big volume, but um, uh, a small handout and a medium-sized package of, of all these results are available. And as they said, they're available online as well. So you can dive further and further into the numbers. So again, thanks so much for coming, and thanks to our panelists.